In this module, we'll cover basic aerodynamics and pedostatics. Aerodynamics has a hierarchy which includes continuum flow and free molecular flow. Continuum flow is divided into inviscid flow and viscous flow. Both of these can be either incompressible or compressible. For this basic aerodynamics module, we'll limit the discussion to subsonic incompressible flow. We'll cover viscous flow in the next module and compressible flow or high speed aerodynamics in a separate module as well. The bottom four blocks are the flight regimes, subsonic, transonic, supersonic, and hypersonic. These regimes are defined by airspeeds relative to the speed of sound, which is given the symbol A. People often forget or are unaware of the fact that speed of sound depends on just one thing, the temperature of the air. And that temperature needs to be in absolute degrees, either Kelvin or Rankine. The formula for speed of sound is the square root of gamma, the ratio of specific heats, the gas constant R in joules per kilogram times Kelvin and the temperature in Kelvin. If you're using Rankine, you would need to convert the gas constant R to equivalent units. Gamma is about 1.4 for air. Once you know the speed of sound at your flight condition, again, you just need temperature, then you can calculate the Mach number, which is your airspeed divided by the speed of sound. Just make sure the units match. Don't use knots over meters per second. Both gamma and Mach number are dimensionless parameters. That will be a trend in aerodynamics. Non-dimensional analysis allows you to compare things of different scales or in different environments. The word sonic refers to the speed of sound. The flow regimes are defined by the Mach number or relation to the speed of sound. Subsonic is where birds and general aviation aircraft fly. But even supersonic aircraft take off, climb, cruise, descend, and land in subsonic conditions. Notice that the transonic regime is a range from about Mach 0.8 to Mach 1.2. It's not just Mach 1.0. Supersonic is up to Mach 5, and hypersonic is above Mach 5. You'll often see critical Mach number when discussing cruise speeds. It's defined as the Mach number where the maximum local velocity anywhere on the wing just reaches sonic or the speed of sound. So the aircraft is still flying at a subsonic Mach number. It's only the local velocity at one point. For Mach numbers greater than the critical Mach number, a normal shock wave will form on the wing. The flow ahead of a normal shock wave is supersonic, whereas the flow behind a normal shock wave is always subsonic. Again, this module is focused on low speeds, but knowledge of the critical Mach number is still important. Here's another diagram defining the flow regimes. This diagram highlights the fact that both subsonic and supersonic local flow exist in the transonic regime. Above Mach 1.2, the flow everywhere is supersonic. Lift and drag are the aerodynamic forces created by relative motion between the aircraft and the surrounding air. Ultimately, we want to adequately predict an aircraft's motion and determine its performance. An understanding of lift and drag are essential to this end. The source of all aerodynamic forces and moments is the pressure and shear stresses acting on the airplane. This is a fundamental aspect of aerodynamics.
A stress is simply a force acting over an area. Units for both pressure and shear stresses are force per unit area. Example, pounds per square foot. Shear stresses are sometimes called viscous or friction stresses. Pressure always acts perpendicular to the surface, while shear stress always acts tangential to the surface. The pressure and shear stress distributions can be determined by specifying the flow field, which is simply the specification of the pressure, density, temperature, and velocity as functions of position and time for every point in the flow. These are the four fundamental properties. Pressure is the normal force per unit area exerted on a surface due to the time rate of change of momentum of the gas molecules impacting the surface. Air molecules are continually moving about in space and therefore have momentum or mass times velocity. When an air molecule strikes a surface, like your hand or the wing, there is an exchange of momentum. By Newton's second law, a force is exerted on the surface, and the sum of the forces of every molecule divided by the surface area of the object is pressure. Again, pressure always acts normal or perpendicular to the surface of an object. In Florida, which is at sea level, the atmospheric pressure on a standard day is 2,116 pounds per square foot. We'll define what a standard day is later in the presentation. Next is density. Density of air is the mass per unit volume. High density flow implies closely compacted air molecules. Density on a standard day is 0 0.002377 slugs per cubic foot. Next, temperature. Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the air molecules. A high temperature flow implies that the air molecules are moving randomly at relatively high speeds. In aerodynamics, an absolute temperature scale is typically used. Absolute zero is the temperature at which the molecules would have zero kinetic energy and represents the theoretical limit for low temperature. The advantage of an absolute temperature scale is that temperatures are always positive. On a standard day, temperature is 59 degrees Fahrenheit or 519 degrees Rankine. And last, we have velocity. Velocity is a vector quantity having both magnitude and direction. The velocity at any point in the flow field is the velocity of an infinitesimally small fluid element, or basically a differential chunk of air, as it sweeps through that point. The four fundamental fluid properties are point properties in that they may be thought to exist at an infinitesimally small point. These properties may vary within a flow field as a function of position and time. If the properties change with time, the flow is said to be unsteady. The steady flow assumption removes the time dependency, such that the flow properties are only functions of position. Obviously, the steady flow assumption greatly simplifies analysis but at the expense of narrowing the scope of applicability. Fortunately, a great number of flow fields of practical interest to the engineer fall within the steady flow assumption. Whereas steady flow is a reasonable assumption for the case of straight level unaccelerated flight, it would be inappropriate to assume steady flow for say, a rapid pitch up maneuver. While a steady flow applies to flow properties that are constant with time, a one-dimensional flow describes flow properties that are constant across a cross-section perpendicular to the flow. Two-dimensional flow is not constant across a perpendicular cut. Note that a one-dimensional flow can be unsteady and a steady flow can be two-dimensional 
Steady and one-dimensional are independent flow classifications. Steady relates to time, whereas one-dimensional relates to orthogonality. Another important concept which pertains to a moving flow is the definition of a streamline. A streamline is a curve which is tangent to the velocity vectors in a flow. If the flow is steady, a streamline is the path traced by a fluid element as it travels through the flow field. Some other properties of streamlines are, one, there is no flow across a streamline. It acts as an imaginary boundary. Two, streamlines cannot cross each other. And three, there are really an infinite number of streamlines in a flow field. Typically, a fixed number of streamlines are evenly spaced upstream of a body. Smoke or colored dyes are often used to visualize the streamlines. As the flow goes around the body, the distance between streamlines changes. In the case of a wing section, which is also known as an airfoil, distances between streamlines decrease as they pass over the top of an airfoil. We will see shortly how this causes changes in velocity and pressure resulting in lift. If the flow is brought to rest at a point along the streamline, that point is called a stagnation point. The streamline which leads to the stagnation point is called the stagnation streamline. Wing sections or airfoils typically have a stagnation point on or near their leading edge and their trailing edge. The flow must simultaneously satisfy the fundamental laws of nature which govern motion and energy. These laws are generally expressed as a system of differential equations with boundary conditions. And just recall, the solution to an algebraic equation is a number, whereas the solution to a differential equation is actually a function. The functions of position and time that satisfy the governing equations are the flow field functions for pressure, temperature, density, and velocity for every point in the flow field. Prior to 1970, aerodynamics involved many simplifying assumptions to get around the overwhelming math. But since then, computers handle the computational burden. It's easy, however, to lose sight of the goal, determine aerodynamic forces and moments to predict aircraft performance. We'll walk through these equations one by one, but the main laws involve the equation of state, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. We can thank scientific legends in history like Newton, Euler, and Bernoulli for their contributions to aerodynamics. A perfect gas is one in which intermolecular forces are assumed to be negligible and at specific heats at constant volume and pressure, C sub P and C sub V, are constant. A true perfect gas does not exist. However, air may be treated as a perfect gas for most aeronautical applications. For a perfect gas, pressure equals density times R times temperature. R, again, is the specific gas constant, a function of the gas considered. And for nominal air, its value is 287 joules per kilogram times degree Kelvin. An examination of the units comprising the gas constant R indicates the temperature used in the equation must be absolute. The equation of state for a perfect gas relates pressure, temperature, and density at any point in the flow field. We now consider how pressure varies within a static or non-moving flow field subjected to gravity. Consider a small fluid element which is in static equilibrium. The forces acting in the vertical direction on this fluid element are 
one, weight, or mass times gravity, two, force due to pressure on the upper surface, and three, force due to pressure on the lower surface. The force on the lower surface is simply the pressure times the differential area, dA. The pressure on the upper surface is unknown, but let's assume it has some incremental change in pressure, or dP, and try to solve for the unknown change in pressure. If we sum all the forces in the y direction and set them equal to zero, since the fluid is static or non-moving, we get the equation in the yellow box. Simply put, as you go up in altitude, or positive dH, the incremental pressure, dP, will be negative. In other words, the pressure will decrease. The equation in the yellow box was originally derived for water and is known as the hydrostatic equation. Applied to a swimming pool, as you dive deeper, the pressure increases. By assuming that the density rho is constant, which is reasonable for a liquid, but not for air over large height changes, and that gravity or g is constant, which is reasonable over small height changes, we can integrate the hydrostatic equation and get the manometry equation shown in the yellow box. A manometer is simply a liquid-filled tube, each end open to a pressure source. The difference in fluid heights in the manometer can then be used to determine the difference in pressure by using the manometry equation. Manometers have been a main staple in wind tunnel testing for years. Students often get confused which density is used in the manometry equation. It's the density of the liquid, not the air. The manometry equation cannot be used to determine pressure in the atmosphere because we know that air density is not constant with altitude. In order to determine how pressure changes within the atmosphere, a relationship between pressure and density is needed. And the integration of the hydrostatic equation would need to be reaccomplished but without the density being constant. Here's a diagram of how manometers can be used in wind tunnels. Today, most wind tunnels use pressure transducers to measure changes in pressure. A discussion of aerodynamics would not be complete without introducing the concept of a standard atmosphere. Air pressure, temperature, and density are a function of altitude. The standard atmosphere, typically presented in a tabular form, is a standard model of how atmospheric properties vary with altitude. It provides a common reference for DOD, academia, and industry. For example, suppose the Air Force wants to purchase an interceptor. In order to compare climb performance between competing aircraft, Manufacturers present data based on their aircraft operating on a standard day, a theoretical day when the pressure, temperature, and density behave exactly as defined in the standard atmosphere. Otherwise, it would be nearly impossible to accurately assess how one aircraft performs against another. The generation of the standard atmosphere is relatively simple. We have three fundamental properties to specify, so we need three equations or relationships. The first is equation of state for a perfect gas. The second, the hydrostatic equation. And the third is empirical standard temperature profile. So based on years of data from weather balloons, aircraft, and rocket testing, a standard profile of how temperature changes within the atmosphere was agreed upon. The results are tabulated in the US standard atmosphere. Most people used the 1962 version since there were only slight changes in the 1976 version. That way, comparisons to programs flown in the 1960s and early 1970s, which is considered one of the golden ages of flight test, can be made. The Earth's atmosphere is made up of 21% oxygen, 78% nitrogen, and 1% of trace gases. I always wonder what you really get when tire stores sell you nitrogen-filled tires. All aircraft spend some time in the troposphere, 
General aviation aircraft like the Piper Cherokee 6 spend all their time in the troposphere. Other aircraft transition to the stratosphere. Getting higher than the stratosphere requires a non-air breathing propulsion system. Here are the values for standard sea level pressure, temperature, and density. An aerospace or flight test engineer should really memorize these values. Sometimes it helps to visualize these values. If you had a column of air that measured one inch by one inch and rose all the way to outer space, and you put that column of air on a scale at sea level, the scale would read 14.7 pounds. If you put the column of air on a scale on a mountain at 18,000 feet, it would read half that amount, or 7.4 pounds. That's an interesting observation. Half of the mass in the, is in the first 18,000 feet, or 3.4 miles of the Earth's atmosphere. The other half of the mass is in the next 300 plus miles. Pressure can be measured in terms of a column of mercury and a barometer. A mercury barometer has a vertical glass tube closed at the top sitting in an open mercury filled basin at the bottom. The weight of the mercury creates a vacuum at the top of the tube known as a Torricellian vacuum. Mercury in the tube adjusts until the weight of the mercury column balances the atmospheric force exerted on the reservoir. On a standard day at sea level, the mercury will be 29.92 inches above the reservoir line. Here's an interesting thought experiment. Does the width of the column of mercury matter? Well, pressure is force per unit area. Force is mass times acceleration due to gravity and mass is density times volume. Since volume is area times height, pressure is then density times area times height times acceleration due to gravity, all divided by area. And since the areas cancel, pressure is just density times height times acceleration due to gravity. The diameter of the tube has no effect. Here are three ways of presenting the data for the standard atmosphere. Again, years and years of weather balloon data went into these empirical models. They all start from the sea level values defined previously. Temperature, pressure, and density all decrease in the first 36,000 feet of the atmosphere, which is where most aircraft fly. Temperature decreases in a linear fashion or a constant lapse rate. It decreases two degrees Celsius for every 1,000 feet increase in altitude. If you prefer Fahrenheit, it decreases 3.5 degrees for every 1,000 feet increase in altitude. An aerospace or flight test engineer should memorize these temperature lapse rates. When looking at the standard atmosphere temperature data, it becomes clear how extreme the environment is for an aircraft. It can take off at 59 degrees Fahrenheit but at 34,000 feet, it flies at minus 62 degrees Fahrenheit, 94 degrees below freezing. It transitions through the freeze line just above 16,000 feet. If you think about it, tall mountains can retain their snow caps in the summer months. Mount Everest at 29,000 feet never thaws out. We know the speed of sound is only temperature dependent. It starts around 660 knots at sea level and goes down to 573 knots at 36,000 feet. Sometimes, especially in propulsion applications, the standard atmosphere is presented in the form of dimensionless ratios. The temperature ratio, or theta, is your current temperature, your ambient temperature, divided by the sea level temperature on a standard day. The pressure ratio delta is your local pressure divided by the standard pressure at sea level on a standard day. There's also an equation where if you know the pressure altitude in feet, you can get delta using the equation shown. 
the density ratio, sigma, is the local density divided by the density at sea level on a standard day. We can use the equation of state to show that sigma is nothing more than delta divided by theta. Here's a simple question. What is altitude? The answer, unfortunately, is, is not simple. In fact, it's quite confusing. Pilots are familiar with AGL and MSL. Above 18,000 feet, they fly what's called flight levels, which is really pressure altitude. Aeronautical engineers are mainly concerned with density altitude because that's what the engines experience, which affects aircraft performance but there's also a temperature altitude that corresponds to standard day temperature. For navigation or geolocation, we may want GPS altitude or an XYZ coordinate reference from the Earth's center. Turns out the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It's more of an ellipse and not a uniform ellipse. So the answer to our simple question is not so simple. Here's a nice graphic that shows your true altitude when flying the same pressure altitude on hotter than standard days and colder than standard days. Let's say there's a mountain at 4,500 feet. On a cold day, you could fly into it even though you're flying at 5,000 feet pressure altitude. That's why pilots fly pressure altitude above 18,000 feet. Below 18,000 feet, they fly MSL using local altimeter settings. You'll hear rules of thumb expressions like, when flying from high to low, look out below. That saying works for either pressure or temperature. If you transition through a weather front where the pressure or temperature is lower on the other side, your true altitude will be less. So look out below. Consider an aircraft flying at 10,000 feet above sea level, the actual geometric altitude. Assume the ambient pressure at the altitude is 1,513 pounds per square foot. From the standard atmosphere, the altitude corresponding to that pressure is 9,000 feet. The aircraft is said to be flying at a pressure altitude of 9,000 feet. Pressure altitude says nothing about how high the aircraft is above sea level. Rather, the aircraft is seeing an air pressure as though it were flying at 9,000 feet on a standard day. The altitude read on a pressure altimeter is actually pressure altitude. If the ambient temperature is 479.5 degrees Rankin, the aircraft is at an 11,000 foot temperature altitude. Using the ideal gas law, it follows that the density must be 0.001839 slugs per cubic feet. Therefore, the density altitude is 8,500 feet. Notice how all four altitudes are different. And in general, this is always the case. The only time they will be equal is if standard day conditions exist, which is not very likely. As an aerospace or flight test engineer, you'll typically fly pressure altitude and record the ambient temperature so that you can correct for non-standard conditions. You can measure pressure altitude and temperature. Density is not practical to measure in flight, so you'll derive it. So exactly how does an altimeter work? Welcome torpedo statics. Altimeters just need static pressure as an input. We'll soon see other pressures exist like dynamic pressure and total pressure, but for now we just need static pressure. Static pressure ports are often flush mounted on the fuselage or on the trailing edge of a blade sensor. For a mechanical altimeter, a change in the static pressure will cause the seal aneroid cell to expand or contract, which through gearing will cause the altimeter needle to wind up or wind down. There is a barometric scale adjustment knob, which the pilot uses 
to set the altimeter to local weather conditions or pressure altitude. 29.92 is equivalent to 29.92 inches of mercury. The local pressure at a specific airfield with a specific elevation could be below or above the standard A value depending on the weather of that day. Thus, if you want to take off or land at the published fuel elevation, you really need your altimeter to be set to the local setting. Air traffic controllers and weather services announce those settings hourly at a minimum and as needed within an hour. We saw how the equation of state was used in the standard atmosphere. Next, we'll look at conservation of mass. The continuity equation is based on the physical law that mass is conserved. Consider the following stream tube, which is nothing more than a bundle of streamlines. Recall that mass cannot cross a streamline. First, let's assume that the flow is one-dimensional or 1D so that the flow properties are constant at every cross section perpendicular to the flow's velocity. By assuming 1D flow, we neglect any variation in velocity across a specific cross section. It can be shown that the mass flow passing across a cross section in a 1D flow is given by the density times the area times the velocity. The units of mass flow our mass per unit time. Next, assume the flow is steady. Properties everywhere in the flow field are time independent. A consequence of this assumption is that the same amount of mass must cross station one as crosses station two. With these assumptions, the continuity equation reduces to the equation in the yellow box. Physically, the equation says that mass is conserved or the mass flow rate is constant. An incompressible flow is one in which the density of the flow remains constant. Of course, there's nothing in nature that is truly incompressible. Even solids will compress under a load. However, in fluid flows, incompressibility or constant density is a reasonable assumption for a couple of cases. One, liquids. We almost always assume liquids to be incompressible. Two, low speed airflow. Velocities below 225 miles per hour or a Mach number below 0.3. As you can see on the graph, as you go beyond Mach 0.3, the density ratio falls be below 0.95. In other words, your air grows beyond 5%. If the flow is incompressible, note that the densities will divide out of the continuity equation and we are left with the equation in the yellow box. Note the dimensions of this equation are volume per time. This is called the volumetric flow rate. It's no longer mass flow. Look at what happens to this equation. As the cross-sectional area of the stream tube decreases, the velocity must increase. This is the phenomena you experience when you place your thumb over the end of a garden hose. This is what happens in a wind tunnel when the area of the test section is smaller than the inlet. How about an airfoil? As the streamlines get closer together as they pass over the airfoil, the mass flowing between them must be speeding up. The continuity equation tells us that the flow accelerates as it passes over a wing. Well, so what? Well, next we're going to explore what this means in terms of pressure. This time we'll apply Newton's second law to a small fluid element. The element is air moving along a streamline. In general, the forces acting on the fluid element are weight or force due to gravity, normal forces, pressure times the surface area acting on all sides, and tangential forces due to friction between adjacent fluid elements.
For the purposes of this development, only the forces in the streamwise direction are shown. In fact, forces due to pressure and friction act on all surfaces. However, these forces will only cause a change in the shape of the streamline, of which we've chosen an arbitrary shape. Therefore, we will only consider the forces which will create accelerations in the streamwise direction. Next, we will make a few assumptions. First, steady flow. Second, negligible body forces. The component of the weight acting in the streamwise direction is very small compared to the forces due to pressure. For air, this is a reasonable assumption for any streamline. For water, this is only true if the streamline always remains horizontal. The third assumption will be inviscid flow. This means the frictional forces are negligible. For air, this is a reasonable for many applications, especially flows that are 1D. Later, when we introduce boundary layers, we will see that inviscid assumption is not valid within a boundary layer. And four, constrain the motion to streamwise direction. Since the velocity is everywhere tangent to the streamline, the direction of ds is always parallel to the local velocity. With these assumptions, we get the equation in the yellow box known as Euler's equation or the momentum equation. Simply stated, a small negative differential change in pressure is balanced by a positive differential change in velocity. In other words, as a fluid element moves along a streamline, it will slow down as the pressure increases or speed up as the pressure decreases. Unfortunately, as a differential equation, Euler's equation does not lend itself to easy application. However, if the flow field of interest is also incompressible, then the density is constant and the equation is easily integrated between two points along a streamline. This gives us the equation in the yellow box known as Bernoulli's equation. Bernoulli's equation is one of the classics in aerodynamics. The equation is now algebraic. Remember, this did not come free. It only applies for incompressible flow. Additionally, the four assumptions of Euler's equation are still buried in the result. The equation is applied along a streamline, steady flow is assumed, and forces due to weight and friction are neglected. So let's pause for a moment. Note that both the continuity and the momentum equation relate properties, pressure, density, and velocity, between two points in a flow. On the other hand, the equation of state can only be applied at a single point, say point A. It says nothing about the properties of some other location, say point B. Different pieces of Bernoulli equation have physical significance and are, have specific names. The first is static pressure. This is the result of random molecular motion. It is the source of aerodynamic forces on a body. It is what we mean when we say pressure. It is what we would feel if we were moving with the flow. Next is dynamic pressure, which has the symbol Q. This is the result of directed molecular motion. It has the regular units of pressure and is defined by the equation Q equals one half the density times the velocity squared. And finally, we have total pressure, which is either P sub T or sometimes P sub zero, depending on the textbook. This is the sum of the static and dynamic pressures. Putting all this together in words, Bernoulli's equation says that the total pressure is constant along a streamline. An analogy can be made between the concept of total pressure and the concept of total energy. Actually, pressure is just energy per unit volume. Consider a frictionless roller coaster. At the beginning of the ride, the car's potential energy is high and its kinetic energy is low. At the bottom of the track, its potential energy is low and its kinetic energy is high. After it climbs back to the top again, it returns to its initial state. Throughout the ride, the total energy, potential plus kinetic, remains constant. All that happened was a conversion of one type of energy to another. Now consider flow of low speed air 
through a convergent divergent duct. As it enters, the velocity is low, therefore the dynamic pressure is low. Static pressure is high. As it passes through the converging section, the, dy the dynamic pressure goes up and the static pressure goes down. Then it returns to its initial state at the end. As in the example of total energy, the total pressure remained constant throughout. All that happened was a conversion of one type of pressure to another. So what happens on the upper surface of an airfoil when the mass flow speeds up? The static pressure goes down. In this analogy, we assume no frictional losses. What would happen to the roller coaster car if friction was present? The car would not make it back up to the top at the end, and it would appear as though there was a loss of total energy. There wasn't, of course. The rest of the energy was used in a heat transfer caused by the friction. A similar thing happens to the total pressure in the presence of frictional losses. Velocity appears in energy equations and Bernoulli's equation. This begs the question, how is velocity measured? In a car, a roller coaster, or other wheeled vehicle, we can relate forward speed to rotations per minute of the wheel. For airspeed, we actually don't measure velocity we calculate it using Bernoulli's equation by measuring the difference between the total pressure of the pitot, which takes in the ram air, and the static pressure. The ram air is brought to a stagnation point, or zero velocity, in the diaphragm, thus becoming total pressure. The static air enters the chamber of the airspeed indicator through the static air line. The diaphragm will expand or contract based on the differential pressures outside the diaphragm from the chamber and inside the diaphragm from the ram air. For a mechanical airspeed indicator, the correct gearing is required to take care of the constants and the square root. But we know density changes with altitude. Airspeed indicators actually use the equation shown involving sea level values of pressure and density. The differential pressure is the only variable. But even that equation doesn't give the actual speed of the aircraft with respect to the air. It's simply a speed the pilot can read on the indicator. In manufacturing the airspeed indicator, we have assumed the airplane is flying at sea level, standard aid conditions, and that we can accurately measure the difference between static and total pressure. Glass cockpits use pressure transducers to measure delta P, or the pressure differential. Pressure applied to the pressure transducer produces a deflection of the internal diaphragm, which introduces strain to the strain gauges. A Wheatstone bridge produces an electrical resistance change proportional to the pressure. Typical accuracy is usually around 0.5% of the full scale. So for an airspeed indicator that goes up to 500 knots, which is the full scale, its accuracy is plus or minus 2.5 knots. We recommend generating an error table in 10 knot increments for pressure transducers, even though they have less mechanical friction. There's one more correction that needs to be applied to determine the calibrated airspeed. It's called position correction because it is a function of where the pitot-static sensors and probes are physically installed on the aircraft. Since an aircraft disrupts the flow field, the static pressure varies along the aircraft geometry. The cartoon graph depicts typical static pressure regions. In some regions, particularly ahead of the main wing, the static pressure is higher than the free stream. Other regions, like between the main wing and the center of the aft fuselage, it's lower. This pressure map can also vary with velocity. Ideally, an aircraft manufacturer will install the static pressure sensor at a location where pressure map matches the free stream. 
Looking at the cartoon graph, three candidates appear. On the main wing, on the fuselage midway between the main wing and the horizontal tail, or the trailing edge of the fuselage just under the horizontal tail. Piper Aircraft installs their pedo and static sensor, which is a blade type device shown in the picture, on the bottom of the wing. They also install an alternate static source on the fuselage midway between the main wing and the horizontal tail. I've also included a picture of a transport aircraft with the location of its pedo and static sensors. Although manufacturers do their best at finding positions, there will always be some residual error that depend on velocity or airspeed. Determining these errors is the job of the flight test team. And based on the previous discussion, it starts with finding an accurate airspeed indicator with full knowledge of the instrument errors. We'll cover the flight test techniques to determine position error in a later module. Once you know calibrated airspeed, you can then determine equivalent airspeed. Equivalent airspeed is calibrated airspeed corrected for the compressibility of the air at a non-trivial Mach number. It is also the airspeed at sea level in the standard atmosphere at which the dynamic pressure is the same as the dynamic pressure at the true airspeed and altitude at which the aircraft is flying. The way to calculate equivalent airspeed is to use an F factor table. For aircraft that fly within 200 knots and 15,000 feet, we can assume F is one and equivalent airspeed is just calibrated airspeed. But for aircraft that fly fast and high like the SR-71, equivalent airspeed can be quite different than calibrated airspeed. You can see an equivalent airspeed indicator in the cockpit photo just under the regular airspeed indicator. Finally, we have true airspeed, which is equivalent airspeed corrected for non-standard sea level density. And all the laws of physics we've seen so far assume true airspeed. Pilots typically use the ice T and square root symbol to remember the relative relationships among the different airspeeds. Indicated and calibrated are fairly close, usually within a few knots. Equivalent airspeed will always be the lowest since the F factors are all below one. True airspeed will be the highest since the density at sea level divided by the local density will always be greater than one. Airplane performance parameters like stall, lift, and drag are all functions of dynamic pressure, which requires true airspeed and the actual density. And that's not really practical. If we do our analysis in a low speed regime, again, less than 225 miles per hour or 0.3 Mach, we can use calibrated airspeed, which is easy to measure, along with the published value of sea level density which is known to be 0.002377 slugs per cubic foot. And this works for any data we'll collect on the Piper Cherokee 6. So let's recap what we've learned from physics. When streamlines get closer together, velocity is high from continuity and pressure is low from Bernoulli. When streamlines get farther apart, Velocity is low from continuity and pressure is high from Bernoulli. The net result is lift. To fly, we need enough lift to overcome the weight of the aircraft. Lift and weight are two of the four key forces in flight. Later, we'll cover the other two forces, thrust and drag. Aeronautical engineers have relied on wind tunnel testing to predict aircraft lift and drag characteristics for years. However, besides scaling issues, there's an interesting phenomenon that happens with total pressure due to the difference in relative velocities of the two different cases. Consider the following two scenarios. Case one is an aircraft in flight 
and case two, the exact same aircraft in an open circuit wind tunnel. Let's find the static pressure at a stagnation point on the nose of the aircraft for both cases. The procedure is the same for either case. Apply Bernoulli's equation along a streamline from a point at infinity to point one. For case one, relative to the airplane, the point at infinity is moving towards point one at V infinity equals V test. The velocity at point one is V1 equals zero because it was given that point one is a stagnation point. Solving for the static pressure at point one, we get pressure at one equals the total pressure equals the pressure at infinity plus one half rho V of our test aircraft squared. So the total pressure is always greater than the atmospheric pressure for an aircraft flying in free flight. The static pressure at any arbitrary point on the aircraft may be greater than or less than the atmospheric pressure, depending on the local flow velocity at that point. For case two, relative to the airplane, the point at infinity is not moving at all. Therefore, V infinity equals zero. Again, the velocity at point one is V1 equals zero because it was given that point one is a stagnation point. Solving for the static pressure at point one, we get the pressure at one is the total pressure is P infinity. So the total pressure is always equal to the atmospheric pressure for an aircraft flying in an open circuit wind tunnel. The static pressure at any arbitrary point on the aircraft, other than a stagnation point, is always gonna be less than the atmospheric pressure regardless of the local flow velocity at that point. The pressures are completely different for these two cases due to the difference in relative velocities. However, the thing that leads to lift is a difference in pressure between the upper and lower surfaces. It can be shown that even though the individual pressures are not the same, the difference in pressure between the upper and lower surfaces for both cases are identical. And that's why wind tunnels work. It is common in aeronautics to make use of dimensionless coefficients. These coefficients simplify analyses and enable easy comparisons between different cases. We will develop most of the aerodynamic coefficients later. One coefficient ratio, which is often used, is the pressure coefficient, or C sub P. It's defined as the static pressure at some location minus the free stream pressure, static pressure, all divided by the free stream dynamic pressure. For cases in which Bernoulli's equation is valid for low speed, the pressure coefficient can be rewritten as one minus the velocity ratio squared. This is a very convenient result. It shows the following. First, at the stagnation point where the velocity is zero, the pressure coefficient is 1.0. Second, on the upper surface of an airfoil, where generally the velocity is higher than the free stream or lower pressure, the pressure coefficient is negative. Third, on the lower surface, where generally the velocity is lower than free stream, which is a higher pressure, then the pressure coefficient is positive. And fourth, the pressure coefficient is zero when the local velocity is equal to the free stream velocity. Since lift is the pressure difference between the upper and lower surfaces integrated over the area of an airfoil, the area between these two pressure curves represents the lift. It's actually the lift coefficient. So we define the four fundamental properties within a flow field. They were pressure, density, temperature, and velocity. We reviewed some of the laws of physics, specifically the equation of state, which gave us the hydrostatic equation, conservation of mass, which gave us the continuity equation, and conservation of momentum, which gave us Bernoulli's equation. We introduced the standard atmosphere. And finally, 
we discussed pedostatics and walked through how altimeters and airspeed indicators work. We now have the tools to calculate the lift. The next topic involves drag, and this will require an introduction to viscous flow.